Welcome to the 700 Club. Some say it's Netanyahu's last chance. He's working hard to convince one or two defectors not to vote for the new government that will possibly unseat him. How fragile is this new coalition? And what can we expect to happen with the Jewish state if it succeeds in taking over? Chris Mitchell explains from Jerusalem. Under the coalition agreement, religious conservative Naftali Bennett would serve as prime minister for the first two years of the new government. Bennett holds strong views that differ from President Joe Biden on key issues, particularly on the Iranian nuclear deal. Biden helped draft the original 2015 Iran deal, and his administration is currently negotiating another one after President Trump pulled out of the original agreement. Bennett explained to CBN News earlier this year why he thought the first one was a bad deal. It gives a false sense of uh, confidence that we've got Iran covered, but it doesn't. The deal, in fact, allows Iran to proceed to the very verge of acquiring not one nuclear weapon, but dozens. All they need to do is press a button, and they'll have, within days, dozens of nuclear bombs. Current Defense Minister Benny Gantz also believes the deal is a threat to Israel's existence. Gantz would remain the defense minister in Bennett's government. In Washington Thursday, Gantz said any disagreements over the deal would be expressed in private. We will continue this important strategic dialogue in private discussion, and by that manner only, not in the media or in the pro pro in, or in a provo provoking way. Netanyahu, on the other hand, publicly challenged the Biden administration this week. If we have to choose, I hope it doesn't happen between friction with our great friend the United States and the elimination of the existential threat. The elimination of the existential threat is increasing. Netanyahu claims Bennett, his possible successor, won't stand up to pressure from the Biden administration on a number of issues including Iran, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and the refunding of the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, or UNRWA. The head of UNRWA came to Jerusalem this week, where he talked about the contentious issue of the Jerusalem neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah. Several Palestinian families face the threat of eviction. He condemned what he says is a violation of international law. Israel disagrees, arguing that there's a Jewish claim to that land. Secretary of State Antony Blinken warned the eviction of Arabs in the neighborhood could lead to conflict and war. Biden and Bennett also disagree on the two-state solution, creating a state for the Palestinians. Biden says it's the only answer. Bennett opposes a Palestinian state. While he would be dealing with the U.S. on issues like the Palestinians in Iran, Bennett would head a divided coalition with many internal ideological differences, including an Arab party that holds anti-Zionist views and is associated with the Muslim Brotherhood. And you would be depending for the first time in Israeli history on an Arab party to hold up the majority. And you could imagine that if Israel got into a security situation like we had just two weeks ago, that a party like Ram in that situation would bolt the government. The one main glue holding the very diverse political coalition together is their desire to oust Netanyahu. The fragile coalition Bennett hopes to lead still needs to be ratified by the full Knesset sometime next week. Until then, Netanyahu is doing what he can to convince one or two possible defectors not to vote for the new coalition. It's perhaps his last opportunity to avoid being out of the office of prime minister for the first time in 12 years. If he succeeds and the coalition fails, Israel could face its fifth election in just over two years. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Well, if you thought our politics was divided, welcome to Israel. There are multiple parties and they're all trying to form coalitions in order to have a, a new prime minister. What, what we're doing, dealing with is sort of an anti-Netanyahu faction that they, they want him out as prime minister. And in that, once they achieve that goal, well, then they won't last. The coalition won't hang together. So regardless of can they form a government uh, or not, and it, it, my, my personal opinion is I don't think they'll be able to hold, hold the co coalition even for a day. But once they have a new prime minister, then the coalition will dissolve and they'll be looking at elections again.
In all of this, please keep in mind UNRWA and the United States coming back to start funding that organization again. This organization needs to go away. It's specifically designed to keep funding Palestinian refugee camps and to keep people in camps as opposed to allowing them to assimilate into other nations, become citizens of other nations, have a hope, have a future. Uh, and what it does is continue to agitate people that you're living in these horrible conditions and it's all because of Israel. On top of that, they're funding specific textbooks and that those textbooks have extraordinary language encouraging children to kill Jews, uh, encouraging anti-Israel sentiment. Uh, our tax dollars should never go to that kind of thing. Uh, I don't know what the administration is thinking. I think that somehow some, some appeasement that if we appease them enough, then they'll come to a peace table. No. We're, we're continuing to fund terrorism. Uh, there's been definite links between UNRWA funding and terrorist activity from Hamas and Gaza. Uh, incitement, uh, definite link to the funding of UNRWA and the incitement of Palestinians against Israel. That needs to stop. It needs to stop now. In other news, President Biden is donating surplus COVID vaccines to countries in need. Efren Graham has that story from the CBN Newsroom. Efren? Gordon, the president says the U.S. will quickly send 25 million doses of those vaccines overseas through a program called COVAX, and it's supported by the United Nations. Those vaccines will go to South and Central America, Asia, and Africa, with more coming by the end of the month. The White House is also launching an operation here at home, encouraging people to get at least one vaccine shot before the 4th of July. These moves come amid more questions about the origin of COVID-19, possibly coming from a lab in Wuhan, China. In an internal memo obtained by Vanity Fair, a former State Department official wrote, staff from two bureaus warn leaders in them not to pursue an investigation into the origin of COVID-19 because it would, quote, open a can of worms if it continued. 58% of Americans now believe COVID was developed in a Chinese lab. That is according to a new survey from The Economist and YouGov. The White House is bluntly directing businesses to shore up their digital defenses after recent multiple cyber attacks. The administration released a memo including a warning no company is safe. CBN White House correspondent Eric Phillips has more on an alarming trend. If you're keeping score, there have been four major cyber attacks in the U.S. in recent weeks, three of them blamed on bad actors in Russia or China. From food to transportation to fuel, America's infrastructure is under attack, and experts say there's likely more to come. The most recent attack happened Wednesday near Cape Cod. Criminals hacking the ferry to Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard and demanding ransom just as the summer season picks up. The FBI now says the JBS food distributor hack last weekend points to criminals in Russia. Meat production now returning to normal at U.S. plants and officials say food quality was not impacted. May's Colonial Pipeline hack impacted the entire East Coast, sending fuel prices soaring and prompting long lines at gas stations. Authorities say Russian hackers were also behind this one. And the nation's largest transit system in New York City now revealing an attack in April when officials say Chinese actors penetrated their system with minimal effects. Huh? This memo from the White House Thursday with a clear warning saying in part, all organizations must recognize that no company is safe from being targeted by ransomware, regardless of size or location. Business leaders have a responsibility to strengthen their cyber defenses, to protect the American public and our economy. Companies that view ransomware as a threat to their core business operations, rather than a simple risk of data theft, will react and recover more effectively. It's a disturbing trend that, while not a new crime, is growing, according to experts. We've observed or observed evidence of uh, ransomware attacks that over 80 food and beverage companies uh, that had they were that led to disruptions from ransomware uh, over the last few years. Uh, this problem is 
escalating and getting increasingly out of hand. Security officials say this is now the main warfare with the potential to be more impactful than any other. And they say now is not the time to be caught unaware. I think the takeaway right now is if you're a corporate executive or a state and local government agency head and you thought that you would be spared, that criminals wouldn't go after you, uh, guess what? They went after our gas and they went after our hot dogs. No one is out of bounds here. While the president signed an executive order laying out new cyber defense plans last month, the White House is quick to say that they can't do it on their own. They need businesses to take steps of their own. And as the president heads into a meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin later on this month, you can be sure that the actions of criminals in Russia that have negatively impacted the U.S. will surely come up. Eric Phillips, CBN News. Troubling and warfare indeed. Gordon? Well, it is troubling, and be aware that this also applies to individuals. It's not just businesses, but uh, you can be targeted. So please do whatever you can to keep your passwords up to date, uh, to keep security protocols, uh, try to avoid open networks. Everybody wants to go to these um, coffee houses and other places for, quote, free Wi-Fi, close quote, all well, that's they're camping out looking for passwords, and so please protect yourself. It's a very dangerous cyber world. Well, it's called Operation Focus. It's known as the most successful air campaign in military history. And in the days leading up to the Six-Day War, Israeli military leaders knew they needed to take out the Egyptian Air Force. And how they did it is nothing short of a miracle. Take a look. In May of 1967, Egypt's president, Gamal Abdel Nasser, declared war on the state of Israel, telling his followers, our path to Palestine will be covered with blood. Nasser moved his troops into the Sinai Peninsula, expelled the UN peacekeepers there, then blocked the Straits of Tehran to Israeli ships. For Israel, it was time to strike or be struck. And for the next three weeks, the Israel Defense Forces were on high alert. The atmosphere in Israel before the war was very tense. People thought we were facing total extinction. 40,000 coffins were prepared, and no one was sure that the IDF could really handle the Arab armies. Two weeks after the birth of my son, I had to leave him without knowing if I would ever see him again. Armed by the Soviet Union, the Egyptians had the largest and best air force in the Arab world. Israel's only chance of survival was a preemptive strike. And the air force had prepared for this moment for more than a decade. Their plan was called Operation Moked, which means focus in Hebrew. Operation Moked was the brainchild of Ezra Reitzman was commander of the Israeli Air Force. He was a pilot himself. He was, a, he was a pilot in the British Air Force in World War II, flew Spitfires, later the president of Israel. And it was an incredibly daring program. The plan was for dozens of squadrons to strike 11 airfields throughout Egypt and the Sinai Peninsula. The main goal was to strike when all the Arab planes were still on the ground, fully exposed. And the idea was to bomb out the runways first to prevent any aircraft from taking off and to keep them from flying for a few days. In 1966, the plan's creator, Ezra Weizmann, had been promoted to IDF Chief of Operations. And his successor, General Moti Hod, now had the task of executing Weizmann's plan. Moti was a commander of the Air Force that kept on flying as a fighter. He understood what we felt in the cockpit. So he understood the issues. Brave man, the nicest person in the world. He had nerves from a metal and always thinking forward ahead like he did on the time to attack Egypt. 
For Israeli civilians, the pre-war tension was high. But for Air Force Squadron Commander Yalo Shavit, Israel's victory was inevitable. The Israeli Air Force is like a tide spring, ready to somebody to cut the cable that prevented it from. It will be done in no time because we have been trained since the last 11 years. I told my wife, go to Gedera. Gedera is a small village in the south. Find a small toferet, a lady tailor. And you know, what do you want to wear for parties with all the Uzunus, prime minister and down? Have three sets. Why three? I said, because I'm telling you to do three. There will be parties. He says, you're crazy. I said, listen to me, go and do it. She did it. She was the best woman dressed in the parties. Israeli intelligence had spent years gathering details about the Egyptian targets. From the location of each plane to the name, rank, and even the voice of each pilot. I was one of the youngest pilots in the Air Force. I had graduated from pilot training the year before the war. I wasn't even 21 years old yet. I was the intelligence officer of the squadron. For three weeks, we learned the most accurate intelligence we could learn. We also prepared the combat doctrine for attacking airports. I was a part of that system. It was so confident that they know exactly what to do. They trained so many times, they knew it with closed eyes. To receive an aircraft with empty fuel tanks, with empty munition, with empty f whatever. And they got to a record of eight minutes. Eight minutes to prepare the aircraft to be ready to take off. Monday morning, the 5th of June, they woke us up and we went down to the base. We knew that the big moment had arrived. The commander of the Air Force came in with the wing commander and they said, Dear friends, Operation Focus will start today at 7.45 a.m. sharp. This is a fateful operation. Friends of yours will be injured and killed in battle right next to you. It is going to be tough, but we will make it. Then the wing commander told us that the fate of the Jewish people was on our shoulders. We were not afraid for ourselves. The only fear was that we would not be able to perform our duties in the best way possible. When I took off, I didn't realize it would be, it would be such a complicated mission. Squadron leaders gave their pilots some ground rules, issued by Commander Motihod. There is no communication whatsoever. No radio, no nothing. So we were prepared with all kinds of signs and flags, colors of the flags. When you were ready to start the engine, where you have to take off, no radio, zero. You fly at zero altitude, the lowest you can. If something happened, you do not report back that you crashed or that you jump. The Air Force will find you. You do whatever it takes to reach to the target. We have to destroy the aircraft on the ground. We were also told that the mission was more important than anything, and that even in an emergency, even if a friend of ours is about to be killed, we were not allowed to warn him. We had to just let him crash. As cruel as that may sound, this was also that we will not disrupt the operation. If someone is attacked, you have to go on and fight. Nearly all of Israel's 196 combat planes were committed to the airstrike. Only 12 were left behind to defend the state of Israel. The planes flew low over the Mediterranean to avoid being detected by radar. We took off and stayed between 35 feet to 50 feet. Impossible below that. We smelled the smell of the salt over the sea. 
מספר שתיים. I was assigned to the foursome that was under Yalo's leadership. I was number two in the squadron, and our mission was to attack the Ensash field near Cairo. Egypt's radar didn't pick them up, but someone else did. At 8.15 Egyptian time, Jordanian radar screens lit up with an unusual concentration of planes heading over the Mediterranean. And from there, a series of mistakes gave the Israelis an overwhelming advantage. The top general in Jordan radioed the word grape, the prearranged code for war, to Egypt's defense minister in Cairo. But the Egyptians had changed the code word the day before without updating Jordan. So the Jordanians' messages were tossed aside and the warning never reached Cairo. But even if the message had been deciphered, there was no one around to read it. Egypt's Air Force commander was at his daughter's wedding. The ground force commander was on vacation. And the defense minister had gone to bed a few hours earlier, leaving orders that he was not to be disturbed. Egypt's chief of staff, Field Marshal Amer, was flying in that morning from an all-night party. So, at the first sign of trouble, the Egyptians shut down their entire air defense system, worried that Amer's plane might be shot down by mistake. Assuming that any Israeli attack would begin at sunrise, the Egyptians had already flown their dawn patrols and returned to base for breakfast. Moti was the man that planned it, caused the soldiers and officers to be creative he hit them exactly in the middle of landing, refueling, eating, ready to go here. Boom. We reached the target, but from a distance of uh, three, four minutes, I saw that there was a fog. So I started circling, finding a hole in this fog that I see the runway. I dive, I bomb the runway, everything was okay. Two is okay. Three, I don't hear anything. Four is okay. Something happened to this excellent officer and pilot that he tried to aim, and meantime, he lost altitude. And when he tried to recover, he hit the runway. But as we were told in the briefing before the takeoff, there is no mercy, there is no... Uh, there is only one thing, keep on doing the job. We turned around 360 degrees and performed the second attack. The planes were already burning and there was a lot of smoke. Those bombers went up in giant flames. First I attacked a bomber that seemed to be less damaged. Then the second time I attacked an anti-aircraft battery and then finally the control tower. The Egyptians fired some anti-aircraft missiles at my plane, but they did not hit me. In the last second, I saw from the left anti-aircraft position, and before I knew what happened, I got a hit by three, four bullets. The front wheel, I saw it disappear. The aircraft stopped. My air brakes went out, and from 500 knots, it went down to 220 in no time. The two other, number two and four, whoosh, flew forward, I gave them an order, go by yourself to the base. Get as soon as possible to the sea, so nobody will shoot at you. As I found myself, after I was hit, at 3,000 foot, looking forward. And what do I see? MiG-21, in front of me, maybe 500 meters, shooting. My instinct immediately is to shoot at him. He broke to the right, I broke to the left, and then close to Israel, I went up to 7,000 in case I bail out. I came to the area of the base, Benny Pellet, the commander of the base in the control tower. Hey, hello, you have a problem, I understand. Uh, go to uh, the sea uh, next to Ashdod and bail out. He says, no. He says, I'm telling you, he says, I hear you. But I know I'm not going to bail out. I said, don't worry. I will land 
on one third of the runway toward the, the fence. So I came there, I hold the aircraft in the lowest speed I can, and I crossed the runway, I touched full brakes. I saw a lot of pieces of fire from the both sides. I crossed the runway, I went to the overrun, a lot of stones and all this, and it stopped. And I went out and I was standing and I saw the security and the emergency, emergency uh, cars. And uh, they were so excited. Where is the pilot? Because they thought that something happened because of the dust and all this. There was no fire because there was no fuel. I came with zero fuel. Zero fuel, nothing in the aircraft, in the tanks, nothing, nothing, nothing. Gradually, the rest of the first wave returned to Israel. In less than eight minutes, the planes were refueled, rearmed, and ready for a second wave of bombing. In just over half an hour, the Egyptians had lost 204 planes, half of their air force. The Israelis had lost only 19. The kill ratio of Operation Focus had exceeded expectations by almost 100%. At half past 10, General Moti Hod turned to the Army's Chief of Staff, Yitzhak Rabin, and announced, the Egyptian Air Force has ceased to exist. The Jordanian and Syrian Air Forces had also been decimated. After less than five hours, the Israelis had complete air superiority over the Middle East. It is truly a Hail Mary operation, but for the Egyptians, it's the ultimate humiliation. And very shortly after the Israeli aerial strike, Israeli ground forces began moving into Sinai. The goals were very limited, very limited. The Egyptians had three defense lines in Sinai. The goal was to take out the first of the three defense lines, not beyond that. But the Egyptian army collapsed so fast and began running away that the other defense lines crashed. And then, as I said earlier, Israeli forces reached the Suez Canal without even intending to reach the Suez Canal. They got sucked into Sinai. So for the Egyptians, this was the ultimate humiliation. It cannot be that the people who just yesterday you had pledged to throw into the sea uh, are now driving you across the Suez Canal. All day long, the Egyptian propaganda machine ran in overdrive. Radio Cairo falsely reported that Egypt had shot down 85 Israeli planes while only losing two of their own. And Field Marshal Amer told the Jordanians that Israel had lost 75% of its air power, a lie that encouraged Jordan's King Hussein to enter the war. So you have to develop a big lie. And the lie is that just the opposite has happened that the Israeli, that the Egyptian Air Force has surprised the Israeli Air Force on the ground and destroyed the Israeli Air Force, that the Egyptian army has crossed in, the border into Israel and is on the outskirts of Tel Aviv. That's the big lie. And this big lie is believed by 200 million Arabs. No one questions, you know, the credibility, no one questions the veracity of these claims. And, you know, there's a certain debate about the degree to which Nasser himself understood or was informed of the direness of the situation. How would you like to be the officer who walked in and said, uh, President Nasser, I got some bad news for you? How would you like to be that person? So maybe people were feeding him strange information. There was one, um, one document I saw in Egypt was that the person who reported the Egyptian victory over the Israeli Air Force was a young Air Force captain by the name of Husni Mubarak. Operation Focus remains one of the most successful air campaigns in military history. During the Six-Day War, the Israeli Air Force destroyed 452 enemy planes, while losing just 46 of their own. After their stunning performance in Egypt, Yalou Shavit and his crew finished the day in Jerusalem, bombing the Jordanian tanks that raced towards the city and providing air cover for Israeli ground forces. It was a long day. 
That night, I came back to the room alone because my roommate got killed that day. It was an exhausting day, both physically and mentally. Not all was taken for granted, even with the feeling of victory we had. No one was free to celebrate. When I think about it now, after years of experience, I still think that this was a very successful mission. If one will ask me uh, uh, what was the thing which uh, made it possible so successful, I would uh, answer, answer it in one word, simplicity. I know that there is a lot of stories about secret weapons which we used, and, uh, but we didn't actually. We, we used the spirit, we used the, the standard of flying, and we used another thing which maybe doesn't exist in any other air forces in the world, and uh, we call it the no alternative. And uh, we, when you don't have alternatives, you can achieve such achievements as we did in this war. They don't know what a group of dedicated people, professionals, trained, willing to invest their soul and everything they have can do for a country. Well, as we were watching that, Terry said, this is like Old Testament, and it is. Uh, it is an absolute miracle what happened, that a war where it looks like everything is against Israel. Uh, the Arab nations are united against her. They're calling out to drive her into the sea. They're literally calling out to massacre all the Jews. There's a sign that's put up in the Ben-Gurion airport in Tel Aviv, uh, the last one to leave, please turn out the lights. There was a uh, sense of uh, overwhelming doom. And, and you heard part of that in, in that wonderful story we just saw. But there's a whole other part, and that is the battle for Jerusalem. You can watch it. You can watch it 4K streaming right now. It's called In Our Hands. That comes from the famous radio broadcast, The Temple Mount is In Our Hands tells the story of the reunification of Jeru Jerusalem. If you want to understand today's headlines, what we're seeing coming out of Israel uh, today, the rocket attacks that were happening, how, how did UNRWA come into being, how, what, what is this conflict all about, why does it never seem to end? If you want to understand today's headlines, you have to watch this movie. In an hour and 40 minutes, you'll get the true story from the point of view of the soldiers who actually fought the battles. Our dialogue is based on their diaries, the actual interviews, newspaper accounts from the day. Uh, it's as accurate as we can make it. And you can see it now in streaming 4K, and we'll also send you a DVD. What we're asking for is a gift of any dollar amount, and your donation will go to fund future documentaries we're working on one right now. How did we get the Bible? How did we get the oracles of God? Uh, and your, your gift will go into that production cost. So if you want to be a part of it, just go to cbn.com slash in our hands, or you can call us 1-800-700-7000 and say, I want to get in our hands. Here's my gift. Well, Father's Day is right around the corner, and the CBN Family app is already celebrating our dads. We have exclusive skits and some stand-up routines from some of today's top Christian comedians. Plus, Gordon shares a five-star steak meal that's easy to make for your dad. You can watch all this by downloading the CBN Family app on your smartphone or your tablet, or you can go to cbnfamily.com. But do it today. Lots of fun stuff up there. Gordon? Well, we're going to take you to a, a real heartbreaking story. There was a wire that was sticking out from a wall, and that pierced the eye of a little girl named Annie. Doctors said if they didn't operate quickly, her eye would have to be removed. Well, Annie's mom barely made enough money for food and for rent, so how could she possibly pay for surgery to save her daughter's sight? Five-year-old Annie and her cousin were playing when they decided to race each other. Neither saw the wire sticking out from the wall until it was too late, and it struck Annie in the eye. She ran to her mom, crying and in pain. She said she was running. I always know where she is. 
I don't know how it could have happened. Annie's mom put a warm washcloth on the eye, but nothing changed. Then Annie said she could not see through the injured eye. That's when Yeri took her to the hospital. It was very hard to see my daughter in that condition. I wonder if she would lose her sight in that eye. Yeri told us that Annie had sustained a complex injury to the cornea and lens of her left eye, which caused a traumatic cataract to form. The doctor referred them to an eye clinic since the surgery was not possible at the hospital. The doctor told me the surgery was quite complicated. He said that if we don't operate on her quickly, the eye would become infected and it would have to be removed. Hearing that was very hard. Yeri is a single mom. She works on a coffee farm in Honduras and earned enough for food and rent, but she didn't have enough to save her daughter's eye. That's when the doctor at the clinic mentioned that Operation Blessing might be able to help. Yeri met with us and we quickly arranged for Annie to receive free eye surgery. Now my daughter's eye is fine. God heard my prayer. I thank him. If Operation Blessing hadn't helped me, I don't know what I would have done. I am so grateful. <laughs> That thank you goes to you. If you're a member of the 700 Club, you're the one that brought help to that little girl. When she needed it most, you were there to help her with the desperately needed surgery. It's amazing what happens when we all get together and say, yes, let's make a difference in the world. Let's do good around the world. If that's you, be a part of it. Call us, 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I want to join the 700 Club. How much is it? Well, it's just $20 a month. That breaks out to 65 cents a day. Some of you can give at higher levels. We have 700 Club Gold for you at $40 a month. We also have 1,000 Club. That's $1,000 a year, and that breaks out to $84 a month. At whatever level you'd like to join with us, give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. You can also go to CBN.com. We've got something new as well where you can text, text CBN to 71777. Now, when you call and join, I've got something for you. It's verses of salvation, peace, and victory from the book of Romans. God is for us. It will encourage you. Uh, you'll listen to it. You can get instant audio streaming. We'll also send you a CD copy. It's yours when you join. So do it now. 1-800-700-7000. And welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. California is hit with legal fees of more than $2 million for discriminating against churches with its pandemic closure orders. A federal lawsuit was brought by South Bay United Pentecostal Church and Father Trevor Burford, a Catholic priest. These come after a previous legal settlement in May, ordering Governor ordering Governor Gavin Newsom to stop violating the First Amendment rights of churches. The Supreme Court had already ruled he was treating houses of worship with harsh penalties and restrictions that didn't match those placed on essential businesses. CBN's Operation Blessing is helping people around the world to recover from job loss due to COVID-19 lockdowns. Krishna is a single mother in India, and she had a hard time taking care of her family after losing her job, and she fell into a lot of debt. She had no one to turn to, saying she lost her hope to survive. But thanks to Operation Blessing's generous partner, she found hope as she was offered a job at an Operation Blessing Center for making masks. When they saw how hard she worked, they blessed her with her own sewing machine. Now her income has increased even more, and she is grateful that she was able to pay back all of her debt. You can find out more about Operation Blessing by visiting ob.org. Surviving isn't supposed to be your normal, but it was for Nicole Crank. For years, Nicole endured relentless emotional and physical abuse. The worst of it, the day her husband put a gun in her mouth and pulled the trigger. So what happened next? Take a look. You know her from her multiple best-selling books, yet Nicole Crank spent much of her life feeling unworthy of love. In her new book, I Will Thrive, Nicole shares her painful history. From being abandoned by her father, raped as a teenager, and having a gun held to her head by her then-husband, 
yet also how just like her adoptive father, God gave her a new identity as his own child. Now a successful author and megachurch pastor, this proud wife, mother, and grandmother wants all of God's children to not just survive, but thrive. Nicole Crank joins us now via Skype. Nicole, it's wonderful to have you with us today. You Hi, Sherry. I'm so glad to be here. <laughs> you start your book with things I can't change. In your case, your biological father left your mother before you were even born, and then you were later adopted. Talk a little bit about those circumstances and how they affected you. Well, you know, I didn't even know I was adopted until I was in fourth grade, which I probably should have clued into because there were pictures of me in my parents' wedding, but I didn't realize that that wasn't the normal child's experience. But in fourth grade was the year that I found out I was adopted. I also got saved. My mom read me a little wordless, or wordless book on our living room floor, and it was also the year I was molested. And I really believe that God came into my life at just the right time to hold my hand because he told me he was never going to leave me and he was never going to forsake me. And so even though my natural father left before I was born, I had a heavenly father who never would. And we know those promises in the word, Nicole, but in those moments when we're faced with all of that, that's a lot for a fourth grader to be confronted with. How did, how did you handle that? Well, you know, the enemy comes no matter what we are with shame and guilt and condemnation, whether we're four or 74, it's the same tools. And so the only way to overcome that is Jesus. If we could help ourselves with self-help books, we would all helped ourselves by now. We don't need self-help. We need spiritual help. We need the Holy Spirit on the inside of us because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So I'm just so thankful that I met Jesus at that time. And that's why I'm so evangelistic, reaching out to people who don't know Jesus, because if I had not met Jesus in fourth grade, I can guarantee you I wouldn't be here today. Later on, you devote a chapter to marrying Mr. Wrong. Wow, that's a title. What happened there? <laughs> um, you know, I felt so unworthy. Life had failed me to that point. Um, but when I was 17 years old and I got pregnant, I failed myself. And I felt like I had more baggage than an airport carousel. And I spend a lot of time in airports and I would look around and I'd be like, I'm carrying all this around with me. Nobody's going to want me. But there was this guy, he had high cheekbones and the right medical initials. And he was looking at me and Terry, as I look back, there were signs and signals that I overlooked. The Holy spirit was inside scratching, but I was trying to self help myself. And I thought I had found the love I'd been looking for my whole life. And I was overlooking the love of the father he'd been giving me my whole life. That relationship became abusive pretty quickly after you married. So having gone through these things as a, a child that left you feeling inadequate and sometimes abandoned, and then this abusive marriage, what was the turning point for you? You know, um, I went into survival mode. And that's why the front of the book says, I will survive. And then it's ripped off and, and it says thrive because after he put a gun in my mouth and he pulled the trigger and it wasn't, it wasn't a Glock where you can't see the bullet. It's like a revolver, a John Wayne gun. You could see every bullet and the bullet, he pulled the trigger. It did not come out. It was a literal miracle in my bedroom. And I got foreclosed on, I went bankrupt and I ran away from the whole world. I told the whole world I was going to Mexico and I ran to Florida to get a job for cash and live in a hotel for cash so he couldn't find me. And that's where God met me because I felt alone again, just like I did in junior high mm -hmm. after I got molested in a whole country town found out. And God gave me the courage. I have a chapter called looking your giant in the eye, having 20 seconds of insane courage. And sometimes that's all we need is 20 seconds to really believe that God is who he says he is. Yeah. You managed to escape your past, but what happened when your past caught up with you? When I came back to St. Louis, I knew I would be facing potential death, that he might hunt me down again. And um, he did. He found me. And I kind of melted a little bit with fear and, and remembrance and shame and all of the things. But God made me strong in that moment and God protected me. And he has since then. And I'm here to tell you, Terry, my whole life up to this moment, all the bad things that happened to me, God makes a promise. And the way I say it in the book is that the depths of your wounds do not determine the height of your future. And that any yeah. pain that the enemy tries to inflict on you is like a slingshot. And God says, he's gonna have to pay seven times. So God says, if I pull back the slingshot a little bit, you don't go very far. 
But if the enemy dares mess with my kids, I'm going to pull that slingshot all the way to the depths of your pain and release it so you go so much further, so much faster than you ever would have anyway. It's the promise we have in Romans 8, 28. You say that you still face giants every day. How do you prepare yourself for these moments? You know, a daily prayer. We're not like cars. You know, we think if if a car is broken, you go and you fix it and you leave. And you can't go to church once and get fixed and leave. It's going to church every week. It's getting in a small group. It's daily prayer and communion with God. And somehow every morning when we do that, he renews our strength and he makes us, it's like a superpower on the inside of us. And it is, it's the Holy Spirit. And it makes us so much greater and stronger than we could be. You know, one of the things I think the enemy does is to bring back those memories of what's happened at times when we're feeling really vulnerable. What do you do then? You know, when I wrote the book, Terry, I intentionally took myself back to that place because I wanted to meet people in the pain that they're at and then quickly take them to the promise so they can skip a lot of the years that I wasted. But in that, I've learned, you know what? You can see the scar where it happened, but when you touch the scar, you don't feel the pain. So it's possible with Jesus, because he's got scars too, to look at the scars but not feel the pain, but to remember and with remembrance say, God, I remember what you delivered me from. And if you did that for me then, I know you'll give me whatever I need today. It's uh, You have a remarkable story and you're very candid about not just what's happened to you, but also very forthright about how God has met you at every turn on the road. Thank you for being with us today. I want our viewers to know you can learn more about Nicole's story in her new book. It's called I Will Thrive and it's available nationwide. You know, I know there are many of you who may be facing difficulty and maybe things in your past that have tried to define who you are and maybe had victory sometimes in that. We always have a prayer line open here and available to you. Our number is toll free. It's 1-800-700-7000. You are welcome to call at any time. And the friend who picks up the phone would love to pray with you today. So take it to Jesus and find out his promises for you. We want to leave you with this word from James 1.3. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to go to grow. That's a promise from God for you. Thanks for being with us today. We'll see you next week. God bless you.